So welcome to the next class. What we're going to be covering today is a continuation of the discussion of the Android interface definition language. And we're going to talk about some of the syntax and supported data types first. And then we're going to go into some more detail about how you implement AIDL interfaces, looking at the internals, what's generated by the AIDL compiler. And then we'll look at some examples illustrating how to use AIDL and the binder for both synchronous and asynchronous communication. So first, let's start by talking about the, the supported data types. So we're going to discuss the syntax for the Android interface definition language and sort of the way in which it's, it uh, supports various kinds of data types that you define in Java. So AIDL allows application developers to declare their business logic methods using a Java-like syntax. So the key thing here is Java-like. If you know Java interfaces, then understanding AIDL is very straightforward. Uh, but be aware, as we'll see in a second, that not everything that you get in a Java interface is going to show up in AIDL. There's a number of restrictions, which are good things to know. So here's a very simple example. This comes out of the Android source code. There's something in there called the, the Dropbox Manager Service, or the I Dropbox Manager Service, I standing for interface. And as you can see there, you can go ahead and add an entry, which is a Dropbox Manager entry. And you can go ahead and then get the next entry. You can iterate through this thing uh, one thing at a time, getting back the entries that are in a Dropbox entry. So you can imagine that that's probably used internally by Android to allow you to access your Dropbox content from your Android phone, which is a very useful thing to be able to do. So here are things that are similar with, with the Java interfaces. So if you know Java, then you know that it's possible to define interfaces that have methods that have typed parameters and optionally a return value. You can also have void to not return anything, but it's common to have a return value of some kind as well. So pretty much everything you know about uh, Java interfaces will apply to AIDL, with a few key exceptions. So here are some of the differences. You cannot define any static fields in AIDL interfaces, whereas you can do that in Java interfaces. Any non-primitive parameters, in other words, things that aren't int, float, double, things like that. They have to be defined indicating the direction in which the parameter is being passed. And the three directions are in, which is the default for, uh, for primitives, and the only way to do it for primitives. And what that says is that the data will be copied from the caller over to the address space of the receiver. So that's what in means. Out means the opposite. It means the data will be copied from the receiver and returned as a so-called out parameter back to the caller. And then finally, in out, which is you pass it in and you get a result back. Uh, I looked through all of Android, and I could find no examples of where anything in Android used the in out parameter passing mode in terms of direction. So it's not very common. Most common things are in. There's some things that use out. And uh, it's important to remember to do this because when you start trying to pass data between address spaces, then you want to limit the amount of data that's passed. So when you say in, it only goes with the request. It doesn't go with the response. When you say out, it only comes back with the response and doesn't, nothing goes over with the request. So that's why they typically do this. And you, this is also characteristic of other interface definition languages, things like Corba or uh, Microsoft's IDL for, they use for COM and DCOM and so on. So this is a, a very common kind of thing to do. Another set of things that are different is that you can have one-way methods. So unlike a regular Java interface where you invoke a method and it basically returns something, which could be void, uh, with, with, but, it, but the point is that when you invoke that method, it's going to block until the method call is done. Whether it returns anything or not, the caller is blocked for the duration of the call in a normal Java interface. With Android and AIDL, however, you can designate methods as being one-way. And one way means that you invoke it, it's copied from the caller's address space down into the, the operating system, and then the call returns right away. It doesn't wait until the call goes over to the receiver side, is turned back into a method call, is processed, and so on. So that means that they're going to return much more quickly. And we're going to use this one way capability later when we start talking about asynchronous mechanisms, and how you can use asynchronous communication in. AIDL by using one way by using a pair of one-way methods. So one-way methods don't block the caller. 
Another thing, methods can't throw exceptions, which is kind of an unusual thing, but that's just one of the things that they, they do. You, you, can't, you can't throw the exceptions yourself. Uh, they don't propagate those through the, uh, the call. That's something that's kind of strange. I don't know why they, they do that. In languages like, like Corba IDL, you can, in fact, throw exceptions, and they get propagated back. And then another thing that you can't do in AIDL that you can do in regular Java, you can't have interfaces that inherit from other interfaces. So you have to do some other thing in order to be able to make them uh, compose together in some way. There's a number of different primitive operations that are supported as parameters or return values from AIDL or AIDL methods in, in Android. Uh, the typical things you'd expect, right? So um, bool, array of bool, byte, int, um, and array of int, long, array of long, character, array of character, uh, float, array of float, double, array of double, etc. Those are all the kinds of things that you can pass back and forth. Uh, you can also return character sequences and strings as well. And just poking around in Android for a few minutes just to look and see what was out there, there's something called the uh, interface for the email service. As you can see here, you can create folders, you can delete folders, you can rename folders, and that allows you to pass in basically uh, account IDs and names of things, the account ID being a long, the string being used as the name. So there's some examples of how you're passing primitives around. Very straightforward, not that much different from normal Java programming. You can also pass around lists. So there's this thing called Java Util List. And internally, it uses the Java Util Array List as the implementation. The mapping of the IDL list abstraction is this underlying Java list abstraction. And you can support generic lists. Here's an example of a, an interface that is defined in, in parts of Android where you can have this thing that will go and look up what network interfaces are available. And you can do this, this query. And when the query is complete, you get back this list of, um, or sorry, you, you go ahead and get back a list of things that have completed, which tell you what operators are connected to the network. So there's an example where you're getting back a list of something, in this case, a list of operator info. So that's how you can use those kinds of things. There's also something called a map, which under the hood maps to the underlying Java hash map. Uh, they don't support generic maps. So you have to give it a type, unlike lists, where you can support generic lists. And uh, when I looked through the Android source code, I couldn't find any examples of, of maps being used. So I guess it's kind of um, sort of a science fiction-like thing, or maybe it's a map of a, a fantasy place that doesn't really exist, like uh, the Shire or, or Mordor or something like that. So they don't really have uh, a lot of use of maps. But they're available if you, if you tend to use them. I think people tend to use uh, parcels and parcelables instead for various things. That's the next topic. So you can actually define your own data types and have them be passable back and forth as parameters or return values from methods defined in AIDL interfaces. And the way that you do this is kind of interesting. So you define your own class, like this is one that I got out of Android, for the status bar icons. There's something called a status bar icon, which implements parcelable. And you, as the implementer of that class, are obliged to fill in a number of hook methods, like read from parcel, write to parcel, and so on. And it the appropriate times as, as Android is doing its thing, it'll end up invoking those methods in the stub or in the proxy in order to get the, the state of the particular instance of this thing and then pass that back and forth under the hood as a parcel. And, and you can see down here, here's an example of how we would use this. We would say, uh, here's an interface called iStatusBar, which is actually a real interface in Android. And you can have a parcelable status bar icon that just says, hey, this, this guy is being defined as a user-defined type with parcelable properties, this read from parcel and write to parcel hook methods that are defined. And then here's a method called set icon that takes in a status bar icon as a parameter. So it's pretty open-ended. You can go ahead and add these things as you see fit to Android, and it, and it makes it easier for you to define types that can be used with the overall IDL uh, AI deal mechanisms that Android supports. Any questions about that? Yeah? Why is there no direction for the primitives? So I can't index, is that? Because in, 
in Java, these particular things are going to be passed by value. Oh, okay. So you, you can't get the result back, because they don't have the, Java doesn't have the same thing you would do in C or C++, where you can take the address of or pass a reference. That's why. So as you can see here, status bar icon is a, is a Java source file. This other thing is an AIDL source file. And so you can make those work together. There's a description that you can find on the Android web page that talks more about how you pass objects. And it goes through and shows you an example of how to do this kind of thing. So to summarize this particular discussion, uh, AIDL, Android Interface Definition Language, is a relatively simple syntax. It's, it's a subset of the full-blown Java interface syntax. And it lets you define interfaces and then define methods that take parameters and return values optionally. Uh, as we talked about before, there, there's a subset of things you can do there. You can't do all the full-blown stuff. The parameters and return values can be any of the supported types we just talked about. And you can even have interface parameters passed. And we'll see this later when we start talking about asynchronous interfaces in, in uh, AIDL. What you can do is you can essentially create objects that live in a client that are instances or implementations of interfaces. And then you can pass the references to those things as parameters or return values to other AIDL methods. And this gives you the very powerful ability to be able to pass essentially objects using factories or other gang of four style patterns. And the receivers, when they get those interfaces, can then make method calls on them. So you can essentially pass remote object references around and access them from other processes in other parts of the system. Uh, and we'll see a bunch of examples of how that works. Basically, what you end up doing is you end up creating this AIDL file using uh, your favorite editor. Typically, you'd end up using either the IDE editor environment that you have in Eclipse or, or your own editor that you may choose, like Emacs or, or VI or whatnot. And the thing you always have to remember is that each interface goes into a separate file. So here's a file that has the iDownload interface. Here's a file that has the iDownload callback interface. Those have to be defined in separate files. And that, that gets a little bit squirrely and confusing at times. You'd like to be able to glom them all together, but they don't support that kind of combination of, of interfaces. You have to do them one per file. And that means, you, as you'll see in a, in a minute when we look at some of the examples, you have to do a little bit of other syntactic sugar to, to make sure that the files know about each other, that they understand. For example, in this particular case, notice how the, the iDownload interface uses a reference to the iDownload callback interface. And so we would have to basically import the iDownload callback interface into this file so it would be visible to be usable by the underlying system. And I think they just did this to make it easier to write the compiler, honestly. There's no need to do it. Other languages give you more powerful ways of being able to deal with multiple interfaces per file.